Okay, so my talk today is going to be on treating random effects and linear models as fixed and testing whether they're zero. But before I begin the talk, I just wanted to make some uh, preliminary comments about um, uh, my introduction to, to CRL. So I met, I met CRL in Auckland at the International Workshop on Matrices and Statistics, but before that I'd been carrying around a number of his books for years. I do quite extensive work overseas and I'll come to that in my talk, but um, so I had, uh, I was, I, the, I used to take copies of several books because there were no PDF versions at the time. Uh, I was in Uganda at one stage and um, I was going to be charged a great deal for excess baggage, so I had to leave my copies of uh, linear, linear statistical inference and uh, um, and and uh, uh, Mitra and Rao in, uh, in Uganda, hoping that they would eventually be returned, and they were. So, uh, but I've been very grateful for many years about the about the material in the in the books and CRR's books, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today sort of leads on from that to some extent. So what I'm going to talk about is really outlined in the abstract here. Um, Wald in 1947 looked at treating random parameters in mixed models as fixed and then testing whether they're zero. And uh, I'm going to try and provide a context for this idea uh, and look at the whether it, and where, when it's an approximation and to what extent it's an approximation by looking at the linear algebra that goes at the back of it. Um, these results that Wald presented were extended um, by Celian and Bozzoni uh, in 1983, and they looked at testing whether some but not all of the random effects are zero. Um, there's a related research stand, which was a strand which I'll come to, um, which looks at the links between linear models with parameters all fixed in one model, but some others, some of them random in another. And more recently, there's been a paper, paper by uh, Hui, Muller and Welsh um, in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Statistics, which extended these results, in trying to find a straightforward, easily comprehended and compre computationally efficient way of conducting a test for zero random parameters. So there's some examples um, in that paper looking at when the approximation works best. But what's been missing to date is any explicit specification of the approximation. So I'm going to, going to look at that approximation and using some explicit forms, uh, which, which came from a, a paper I wrote back in 1996, which allowed deletion of the sub-equation that specifies whether some of the model parameters are random rather than fixed. So there are three strands from the literature I'm going to talk about. Um, one's treating parameters as fixed, the other is stochastic constraints, which is really uh, from Rao and Tartenberg. Um, and the third is updating linear models. So the main references for treating random parameters as fixed are the ones I've outlined, which are Wald and Seeley and Vizianui, and, um, uh, and, and the paper by Hui Muller and Welsh, which appeared more recently. So this problem's got a long history. Wald's paper was 1947. And what uh, the outline of what's going on here is if we consider a mixed linear model outlined by this equation here, where pi is the fixed parameters and b is the random ones, uh, I'm not going to focus very much on normality and assumptions at the moment, but look at BLUP instead. But Wall showed how to construct a confidence interval for testing whether the, um, uh, we're looking at the, the correlation coefficient, or, the, or not so much correlation coefficient, but the ratio, um, of the two variance, variances. Um, again, I said it was uh, Wald assumed full rank, and, we're, and um, but that was extended in 1983. So that's the core idea. We're going to look at that problem of, you know, how close is using fixed parameters for B uh, and testing whether they're zero to the problem of testing whether when B is random uh, and testing whether those parameters are zero. Now I'm going to use a slightly different notation. I'm going to substitute beta for pi and z for b and gamma for for b, small b. And I'll also consider broad, more broadly cases where the variances of the random effects and the error are not diagonal and don't have equal diagonal elements. But I will, however, consider only linear and linear mixed models where I've got full rank. 
just because uh, in a talk it's very difficult to go much further than that. Uh, and where additionally the um, the column spaces of X and Z don't intersect. So I'll be looking at this model here, Y equals Z beta plus Z1 gamma 1 plus Z2 gamma 2 plus E with variance of E equal to R and the variance of gamma equal to this um, block structure equal to G. That's the case where Gamma 2 is random in one model and fixed in another, but actually what I'm going to do in the focus in the end is all of gamma is going to be treated as fixed. So stochastic constraints. So when gamma is treated as fixed in one model and a random in another, the two models can be written in this way. The first one's just the case where beta and gamma are fixed. Uh, so there's only one variance and that's for the error process. And the second one, is the stochastic constraints construct um, due to round, well, outlined in round Tottenberg. And you'll see here that there's an additional equation um, at the bottom of the equation for y. And what it actually says is gamma equals minus u. And I could have put gamma equals u and put a minus i instead, but let's treat it this way. Uh, but the point is about the second equation is it cleverly incorporates the additional information that you don't usually see written down very clearly or explicitly when you're talking about random effects. It relates the first order properties to the second order properties for the random parameters. Now, this is a possible confusion I just want to cover very briefly in the structure in two, that random uh, mixed effects model um, is denoted as random parameters as fixed, but there's a debate about whether it's a model um, I happen to think it is, and Sima Puntin thinks it isn't, but that's not not a, a, an argument for here. Um, but it's if sometimes when people use the random parameters treated as fixed, what they're actually referring to is the second equation, and they're acting as though in that second equation, despite it making no sense, they treat gamma as fixed, but it, computationally it works perfectly. All right. My point is that if you treat it as random, you can carry through with all the algebra and a calculus and you still get the right answer without needing that assumption. But the point is that we just treat it as a computational trick at the moment. Um, just a small note in this here, um, if we let G tend to zero in this model, we don't actually get the first model, just as a, a point of note to note. Updating linear models, well, um, paper in linear algebra and its applications in 1996, I outlined the explicit formula for addition and deletion of data parameters and simultaneous deletion of data and parameters from linear models. So these give changes to parameter estimates, residual sums of squares and the variance of the difference. Um, we'll see we're only interested in the difference now between treating parameters as random and treating them as fixed rather than whether they're zero. And I'll explain why that's the case shortly with some diagrams. So it turns out the formula that we're interested in is for deletion of data in this context. So here's the result. We start off with the first model, number three, and we update it by adding extra data uh, and regresses uh, and a bit more to the error term. Um, all matrices of full rank. And what we actually want is what's the relationship between the estimates of beta one in this model, in the two models rather. And the answer is these equations five, six, and seven with the various things written underneath that uh, define the terms. Now, I just want to note that this matrix CA plus CB to the minus one occurs in all of the things and that we'll come back to this later, but the in six and seven, the difference relates to a quadratic form and in the first adds to the residual sum of squares, and in the second subtracts from the variance of the of the um, parameter estimates less the um, uh, of the estimate of the parameter estimates less the, the actual value. Um, the point about this is that there's not a lot of extra matrix inversions, given that if you fit the model, um, the first model, uh, number three first, then um, sigma one one to the minus one is known. Uh, and consequently, you don't need to invert any matrices of larger order than um, than the uh, extra Y2 that you've added. All right.
Um, you can treat this as updating, adding data, or if you look, go look in reverse, it looks at deletion of observations. Um, part or all of beta one may be random. Um, that's covered in the 1996 paper. Um, but we can treat this random to fixed as a special case of the theorem. But I've got to digress a little. What does a random parameter equal to zero mean? Um, by construction, the unconditional expectation of the random parameters is zero. And looking at the situation where the column space is to intersect, we've got uh, two possibilities that gamma is fixed or and gamma equals zero. But we need to consider what happens if you look at the expected value of gamma given the labels that are on, might be on these. So if you've got groups, um, clusters, in my case, I get to a cost situation where you've got small areas and small area estimation shortly. The labels are sometimes very, very important. In other words, in repeated sampling and rerunning models, what you get is that the random effects show some consistency for a given small area. And although their unconditional expectation is zero. Um, I've used this quite often in um, in, in work I do for the for the World Food Program. This is an example of uh, looking at severe stunting in children uh, at ELICA level, of which there's about a thousand uh, in Nepal. Um, you can see that stunting severe st prevalent in the mountains, is so in the Terai on the plains, but uh, for different variables, you get different answers. Now, these models are fitted essentially using mixed models uh, and applying a mixed model from a survey to a census. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but the point is the labels matter. And that's exactly the situation I was talking about here, this expectation conditional on the small area. So when we're dealing with this, we need really to think about this expected value of gamma uh, given I as one option for treating gamma equal to zero. And I'm going to provide some diagrams shortly um, that will link uh, this idea. So I'm going to have three diagrams. One's the simple walled case plus this expectation of gamma given I equals zero. I'm going to look at a full partial deletion case, which is the one where you delete, where you essentially set part of gamma equal to uh, zero. And then I'm going to look at a subset of those, which I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. The important point is there's going to be this little triangle three in the first diagram, because what we have is a schematic diagram, bottom right, beta is fixed and gamma is random, but three moves it to beta fixed and gamma fixed. And pathways one and two go from each of those options to beta fix gamma equals to zero, but the difference between them is the one I've got to try, number three. So a lot of the talk is from here will focus on this uh, pathway number three, because although I'm interested in ten and in the other from beta fix to gamma fix, the difference between them is pathway three. Now, this gets a lot more complicated if you look at that diagram and start to look at situations where parts of gamma are changing and you've got the possibility that these expectations of gamma conditional on, on a small area or a set of small areas come in. And I'm not going to focus very much on this diagram except to say that each step in here is basically one change. And you can see there are a lot of things that connect up to one another. And it's really only part of this which has been discussed so far in the literature. I'm not going to talk at a great at any depth at all about the the, the expectation of gamma one uh, conditional uh, equal to zero or gamma two conditional equal to zero. I just want to point out the situation is not perhaps quite as straightforward as it may first appear. So what I'm going to focus on is part of that diagram. And you can see that, in fact, the ones that I will focus on uh, almost entirely um, are the ones that are in the in the brighter green color, which is the original diagram that we had, the first diagram I showed. And the other ones indicate the situation where you move to part going to random or part going to zero. Um, and those are the case, the ones dealt, in the, dealt with in the 1983 paper. So I'm going to focus on the ones that are in the sort of lime green color and talk more about that. 
sorry, I just noticed that in that diagram top left, gamma 2 minus 0 is meant to say gamma 2 equals 0. Okay, so this is the framework we're working in, focusing on the lime green ones. Um, so what we're going to look at is using stochastic restrictions. As I say, I'm going to put aside some of these ones with E gamma equals I and E gamma, um, e gamma given I equals zero. Um, so, and then it's pathway three, as I commented on, that corresponds to the one that we're going to need to focus on. And pathway three corresponds to deletion of data. So the connection between stochastic constraints and deletion and observations or addition of them will now be the focus. So we go back to the, what we had for addition or deletion of observations. Addition, if you go from three from, to four, four to three gives deletion. And we now put into the formula that we had the uh, arrangement for stochastic constraints, and we end up with this structure here. Um, there are quite a number of terms in here, and I'm not expecting you to absorb them all, but the same thing applies as before. No, no large matrix inversions. And in fact, for GB, we can actually get an explicit form that doesn't involve a block um, inverse. Uh, and no surprise, the beta one in the model now consists of the fixed parameters and the random ones. Um, you can do a similar substitution if only gamma two is going to be treated as fixed, but I'm not going to do that, as I said, because the algebra gets more complicated. You have to invert a three by three block matrix and it's going to make the exposition more difficult to uh, explain. So I'm going to let, uh, give these, put these structures in here. You recall that X is the part that was fixed all along, R is the um, covariance of the errors in the process, and S is defined in the way above, or rather S minus one. And I've got a few other terms there that basically look like the sorts of things you get in regression generally. Um, the first one, the PXR is just the um, regression of of, of uh, y on x, and the second one relates to uh, rather more to what uh, could be uh, random or could be for the fixed part of the model. And if we do that and use um, uh, the linear statistical inference um, material in Rao 1973, what we get is the following things here. And you'll see, at least in this format, they're not terribly they're not terribly complicated. Um, so we've now got explicit results for changing fixed parameters as fixed and hence vice versa from five, uh, six and seven. And these are them here. And we'll see that, you know, we've again got uh, uh, the change in beta. There's a change in the beta parameter, even though it's the fixed one. And there's certainly a change in the gamma parameter, which I've made explicit at the bottom. Um, and that's the change from moving from fixed um, from random to fixed or fixed to random. Um, now, I think that the signs of these things are not are rather dependent on Y, as you'll see. I mean, it's not simply a case of one being smaller than the other, etc. Um, it's very much a question of what your data Y is. But for when you get onto the residual sums of squares, that's not true. You'll see here that the residual sum of squares for the um, first model has added to it something when you go to the second. And what that's saying is when you go from fixed to random, the residual sum of squares increases. Hmm. And this is because this 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 uh, uh, term here is a quadratic form. So the fixed parameter model necessarily has a smaller residual sums of squares than the one in which gamma is random. Now you are basically a applying constraints. Gamma random forces a distributional structure on, on gamma tilde that's not part of gamma hat. In other words, onto the, onto the random structure rather than the fixed one. And you could use all sorts of other distributions and, and, and uh, Alan Welsh is looking into that at the moment. But an indication of which distribution might best be used may be available through looking at the pattern of the corresponding fixed effects if you were to fit the model with gamma fixed. But in contrast, the variance of the difference of the um, parameter estimates from or, or predictions from the actual parameter um, does the opposite. So treating gamma as fixed increases the variance of the parameter estimates relative to treating gamma as random. 
And this is actually a strong argument in favour of fitting models that include random parameters when it's practical to do so. So the two things op operate in different from random to fixed, the variance increases. Uh, but if you go from random to fixed, the residual sum of squares decreases. Uh, again, no further in, uh, inversion of mat large matrices is required. It's really only the dimension of gamma that, um, that requires an inversion. And it's a core, a core advantage of using updating equations rather than completely refitting the model. That's especially so if the model is of high dimension. So uh, an example, uh, one of the simplest cases is when Z, the, the matrix of zeros and ones that multiplies gamma, uh, is columns containing group membership and hence zeros and ones, all columns orthogonal. With e I'm going to look at the equal numbers of observations per group example, R diagonal, and so is G. Um, the, the Hui paper um, simulates this and notes that this and in other situations, the walled approximation works well when there are many groups with few members in each, but not so well when there are a few groups each with many members. Uh, I've reparametrized the usual model to ensure the uh, column space intersection zero. Um, but the model that you get is still linear, linearly sufficient, so this isn't an issue. Um, there's a, a, a paper that um, I, I was one of the co-authors for that, that deals with this linear su sufficiency. So, the change from random effects to fixed effects, RSS reduces, um, the, um, it reduces by this linear form. Um, it leads to similar, we look, we, it, uh, using the formula here, we get to a very similar conclusion to Hui et al. With increasing numbers of observations per group, this um, function CA plus CB to the minus one approximately equals the inverse of the variance of the random effects, provided the variance is not too small relative to the variance for the model error. Um, but what happens is due to the order of the various effects, the conclusion that we came to and we at HAL came to is pretty much the conclusion that comes out of this or directly out of this. And in fact, there's now an explicit form for the accuracy of the approximation. I haven't provided all the um, formula at this, on the, in this talk. But that's a really, this slide just summarizes all of that, talks about the quadratic forms, talks about the terms in those quadratic forms, talks about the order of them, and looks at the when, when the walled approximation is likely to work best. In other words, the walled approximation is treat your para random parameters as fixed and test whether they're zero rather than treating them as random and testing whether they're zero because that's computationally rather more intensive. Conclusions. So firstly, covariance matrices have been assumed known or estimated for one model and then reused for another. Uh, in practice, the model, mixed model software re-estimates these for each fitted model. So uh, there'll be actually an R hat and a G hat for the two models. Well, G hat will be zero when you're treating parameters as fixed, the random parameters as fixed. But there's, so there's an element to which these are first approximations. However, any difference between adjacent models should be comparatively small and they can be checked through the relevant computer output. So we've now got an explicit method for checking whether the approximation of walls is sufficiently accurate. The method can be extended to the case where only some of the random parameters change. The, those extensive uh, schemata I've provided that link the various models will allow models that include conditional means of random effects, in other words, terms of the expected value of gamma given the labels. They can be considered using the formula for additional parameters, which I haven't covered here, that are in Hazlitt 1996. And finally, um, there are cases where these conditions of full, not of full rank, uh, or where the uh, intersection of the column spaces isn't zero that remain to be explored. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hasley. It's a very interesting presentation. I have much interest in linear models and fixed, mixed, and random effects models. I have closely followed the work by 
Shimo Puntanen, sitting in Tampere. It's good that you have also collaborated with him. It's very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank if there you are any questions or comments, let's take up. Thank you, Professor Steve. Is there any question or comment? Hey, Dr. Hasley, I have a small point to make. In the, in the, towards the end, you mentioned about the number of groups and the number of observations per group. Because we are dealing with a random effects model, to be able to estimate the variance component attached to the random effects, we need more number of groups than fewer groups with more observations. So what you have said is just right. We need more number of groups to be able to estimate consistently the variance component. That was your observation. OK. Now, any further questions or comments? So we are at the right time. Let me thank both the speakers, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Hasley, for making interesting and very relevant presentations relating to the life and work of Professor C.R. Rao. So to conclude, let us hope that Professor Rao will have a peaceful life in the years to come. Thanks for your participation. Back to Thank the organizers. You.